Hi, I'm Jason Arp. I am the City Councilman for the 4th District of the City of Fort Wayne. Today we're going to be talking about the Electroworks Project, which is uh, the old uh, GE campus that is on Broadway. And uh, talk about the financing. We, we spoke earlier uh, about this. Um, there's a couple things that um, have been pointed out to me since then. But um, first, we'll, we'll go back over. We talked about the, the project cost being $440 million. I want to clarify something that's actually the entire thing so there's two phases there's the the west side of the street and the east side of the street that are roughly the same 220 million dollar um, project cost that the developer is estimating and that also means that the fair market value that we derived and we you know went through the discount rate and all that stuff in, in other videos um, that is also split evenly between the two parcels and these numbers, I believe, um, tie, well, I, I saw that they tie with the developer's spreadsheet, and I've seen that they are, um, that the assessment numbers that they're coming up with on what they're deriving with the tax value would be, are also similar to these numbers. So um, that still leaves us with a $200 million, $290 million overpayment, um, and that is $145 million for each portion of the project that is uh, that we're overpaying for. So we're overpaying um, by $145 million um, on the $220 million. In other words, we're, we're still close to that three to one ratio that we had talked about before. I'm gonna erase this and then I'm gonna put up the some of the details on the capital stack. Um, this overpayment is something that we talked about Mises earlier. Mises would, would call that overpayment malinvestment. This is uh, money that is not used to its highest economic potential. All of this. What we have here is the East. This will be the East Campus. Um, we have a variety of residential and commercial properties here. And across Broadway to the west is going to be the West Campus, of course. Also, uh, mostly commercial. There will be some residential in that property. Um, and then here we have the Nor Norfolk Southern train line um, that um, we continue to have trains through here. But what we have here, this is the capital structure for the Electric Works project. Um, so all the sources of the money that's going to make up the total of 440 that we talked about before and the basically 220 million dollars per side uh, this is the, the west side and the east side and these are all projections and may change um, and but this is what has been shared with council um, by the developers so you see that um, you've got a total of 141 million dollars of debt for both sides on the on the the west side which is a little bit more firm because this is they're, they're making the case to city council and other local governmental entities to come up with the 65 million this is what they've laid out for so new market tax credits of about eight million dollars in this first part uh, federal uh, historic tax credits of 30 million um, and then the uh, state tax credits of 33 million as I mentioned before, the local money, which would be a mix of uh, the Capital Improvement Board, the CIB, that's the food and beverage tax. You've got um, legacy funding um, and some other things that we'll get to later. This number may not be all inclusive. And then finally, the developer's equity. Um, I don't know if, if you haven't seen, I've posted a video of the actual discussion that I had with the developers at the city council table. This is the $18 million of equity that they were talking about. Um, so to correct something that we had talked about before earlier in an um, earlier video, we didn't, um, that discussion, when I was going over the numbers with the developer, we were talking about the $440 million total project and a total uh, market value of $150 million for the entire project. And then when I asked the developer how much equity he's, that they were going to have in it, um, he mentioned $18 million. Well, that 18 was actually only for the first part. So um, since then, I've, I've seen uh, a, a different presentation that shows that they um, may have an additional $31 million for the second part. 
but we're not there yet and I don't believe that's been raised and we'll also get to a couple other issues with this 18 in just a, a little bit. So you can see where the, where the sources of capital are coming from. Now one of the projects that the developers have, have mentioned quite a few times of, uh, of a success story that's a similar type of million square foot project was in Durham, North Carolina, where they did the American Tobacco Campus, uh, which is the old American Tobacco Company uh, manufacturing facility where they made Lucky Strike cigarettes. And there, um, I'm having to kind of guess at some of these things, but the, the $100 million new market tax credits number is a, uh, that's a confirmed number. Um, and the, the local investment of $43 million in that phase is also a confirmed number. And we know um, that they had substantial amounts of federal historic tax credits and North Carolina state tax credits. And then we're kind of having to assume and I know assuming is not a great thing, but we're having to assume that equity was probably 10% because it's roughly what most of these deals are looking like. If you remember in the landing, the landing total projected cost is 30, about 33, $34 million. And the, the investors, the, um, the uh, equity investors, the model group um, committed $3 million, which is 10%. It looks like we're kind of running that same, um, same procedure in these as well. So anyway, um, interesting about the American Tobacco Campus, it was, that project was actually split up in, in multiple pieces and portions of it um, filed for uh, foreclosure. And uh, in some news accounts to say that there was a, a bankruptcy filed by the developer, the very same developer that is the lead in putting together our General Electric's project. Um, as you can see, there's lots of different sources, and this is a very highly leveraged um, project. And you think about it, you got a project that is worth the fair market value of the total thing when it's done, like we mentioned before, $157 million, and we're using $440 million worth of financing to create it. We had talked about the, the $18 million of... equity being uh, put into this project by the developer, or at least that's what they were letting us to, um, that's what they said at the council table. This is for the developer's equity. Um, taking a, a closer inspection of the documents that have been prepared and, and uh, the pro forma that I still don't have an actual physical copy of this pro forma. The, uh, I sat down with the developers and they kind of ran through some numbers on a, a computer screen and I also sat down with uh, some other uh, members of the community that are um, in the real estate business that, that have shown me uh, some details about this. But um, this $18 million equity is not all from the developer. In fact, 80% of it are from unknown to us limited partners. The other 20% is from the developer of the project, which is RTM Ventures. And RTM Ventures then is actually made up of multiple LLCs, um, which includes Cross Street. Uh, partners. So that 20% actually means $3.6 million. So when we were talking about who, where the capital contributions for this project were coming from at the table, um, and I thought we were talking in the context of the, the entire $440 million project. Apparently the developer was giving me the numbers for only half of that, the $220 million of the first phase, which is the West Campus. But still we're looking at um, their contribution, which he was saying was coming from Cross Street, Green Street, and uh, Biggs Development. Um, and they were throwing out a $18 million number because they said that they would have other limited partners. So those other limited partners are actually 80% of that. So their portion is only 3.6. 
So a $3.6 million of equity investment from the developers. However, in the video, um, we talked about a development fee that they said would be around $15 million that they're going to receive up front or you know, when, whenever they reach certain substantial completion measures. But they're going to be making five times as much almost as what their, their initial investment is. Um, in fact, if you get deeper into the spreadsheet, you'll find that this $15 million development fee, um, once you add a couple of additional professional um, service fees in there that are within, that they're expecting, we're getting up to $16.7 um, million dollars worth of development fees that they're going to receive up front. So they're not going to be taking any risk. They're getting all of their capital back. Um, well before the refinancing of the new market tax credits occur in seven years. So I only had this level of detail for phase one. I would assume that we're going to end up with something similar for phase two. Um, so while there may be a higher kind of on paper uh, equity investment for the entire project, in phase one, the developers are actually only putting in $3.6 million. Okay, here you have um, kind of what the capital structure looks like from a different point of view. You've got the senior debt, which um, f according to what the, the uh, developers put out there, would be $141 million. This is going to be private. And as of now, I don't know who the source of that um, pri private senior debt will be. The what I'm classifying as junior debt here is um, these are all, all these different governmental sources. So they may not actually be debt, but they're going to be you know all the the different governmental sources. Then we got the limited partners, and then we've got the developer, who's the general partner here, um, and that makes up our total capital structure of about 440 million dollars. Now, what happens in a bankruptcy, if there is such a thing, if, if, if let's just say that the project doesn't work out, they're unable to, to, to make the payments on the senior debt, and then this, the senior note holder says, okay, well, this project's worth about $150 million, um, and I've got $141 million in it. Now, this may be multiple people, and there could be multiple layers, and I, I suspect that there probably would. This would be a syndicated loan or a number of syndicated loans with certain um, levels of subordination. But if they say, okay, we're not getting paid, so we're going to you know, refinance this thing and let somebody else take a shot at making the payments, then all of this gets wiped out. And so like some of these, these tax credits, they expire over a period of time and they have to be refinanced. So the like new market tax credits, after seven years, they go away. They have to be refinanced. Um, and then if, if they file bankruptcy or if they, they go into a foreclosure, that means all of these people can be wiped out. They would go to zero and then this debt would then be just on the, the, the property itself. Now, remember that the developers already received what we believe to be $17 million of payments for having done the project. So they're not going to be too worried about the $3.6 million that they lost. In fact, that's just going to be a cost of doing business to them. Um, these folks right here, uh, depending on who they are, that may be a material loss to them and, and uh, a big deal. And then to the taxpayer, we should all be very concerned that the city of Fort Wayne um, will lose whatever commitments that we had for our $100 million uh, that, we've, that we've put forward to this. And so if we're talking about making uh, legacy loans or loans through CIB in which uh, we're expecting repayment for those, and they put themselves in a junior position to whoever the senior mortgage note holder is, then the city and the, the taxpayers of Allen County will be left holding the bag in this particular scenario. This doesn't necessarily have to happen this way, but there's a potential that it could. And in fact, um, if we look at the different phases of 
the American Tobacco Campus, um, they, that was broken into a 160, 161 million piece and a, and a $94 million piece. The American Tobacco Campus portion, and you had this portion here, phase one, had multiple groups involved, and the fact of the matter is, is this did go through a foreclosure process. And these parcels, I went through and looked at all of the um, tax records for uh, Durham County, which is where the city of Durham, North Carolina is located, and all the properties that are in this uh, American Tobacco Campus. Um, these things have resold over the years for about 50 million, which would approach kind of that one third of the total finance cost ratio. So, um, you know, there, there is a precedent for this sort of thing to happen. And I, 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 I can't remember if I mentioned this before, but uh, Stroiver Brothers, Eccles, uh, and, and Royce was the initial um, developer on that project in, on the American Tobacco Campus. They have since gone through a reorganization in which they've renamed themselves Cross Street Partners. And it's a lot of the same um, officials and executives that are involved in Cross Street Partners are also um, were the principals of the SBER, which was the, 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 the company that was foreclosed on, the, the developer that, that had to go through foreclosure in the American Tobacco Campus. And if you go through, you, all you have to do is Google um, Stroiver Brothers, Eccles, and Royce, and you can see that there's a number of projects in which they've gone through financial troubles uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, um, Baltimore, all, and, and other places throughout the country in which they had um, either gone through foreclosure or were very late on payments. In fact, at one point, um, one of the large national banks had to sue them for uh, $5 million in late payments on a loan on one of these projects. So um, that's kind of the update that I have on this um, project. Um, actually, there's, there's one initial other bit that I think we should consider is that the, the GE campus has been purchased um, and in the spreadsheet, it shows that the land acquisition cost was five million five hundred thousand dollars, and then there's um, some additional site prep work. So that's just kind of cleaning it up, so that way they can take tours of it and bring people through and, and do the media type stuff. And that's like a hundred k. And then there's an additional in in the developer's plan. There's an additional land acquisition cost of $5 million. And so if you, you know, run this all through, you're looking at $10.6 million. What this additional $5 million is, is we, we don't know. Um, so I haven't been able to get all the records yet to determine what the transfer of title was in the purchase of the General Electric um, but it's possible that someone bought the land and, and the, the developer um, is, has basically bought it through a mortgage with whoever the original buyer was with the intent to um, pay off that mortgage at $10 million. We don't know. These are details that, that haven't been brought to council. Um, we'll see as, as things develop. Um, so now, what I've outlined for you so far has shown that this thing is a, it's pretty highly leveraged. Um, there's a, a history of projects that are like this not working out and being, you know, end up selling through foreclosure at a much lower, you know, 25 cents, 30 cents on the dollar type of thing. Um, but I know there's a lot of people that are very excited about this project, but, you know, there's it's a really big project. We're talking, you know, um, $450 million of total 
project costs, $150 million of uh, market value potentially. But going back to a number that we use in our, our first video, um, and we're looking at 1.26 million square feet of space. And about a, just less than a, you know, a fifth of it, we'll just call it 0.26, that's, that would be 260,000 square feet of potential residential, maybe. And again, I haven't seen all of these numbers in detail. I, I have seen uh, parts of it. I have, do, I have not been given access to actually be able to do a thorough evaluation of all of the different pieces other than to sit down and, and spend maybe uh, you know half an hour or an hour with the developer or other people that have access to it. All right. So we're looking at a million square feet of commercial real estate. Now I've met with uh, someone that, that would know exactly how many square feet there are in downtown Fort Wayne. And um, there is about 2.5 million total Class A and Class B commercial real estate available in downtown Fort Wayne. So by adding another million, we're going to take that to 3.5 million, you're increasing the total supply of real estate, of commercial grade office real estate, um, and office and, and, and retail, by over 40%. I mean, that's a massive increase in the supply. So what is that going to do to the prices of real estate? The developer's planning on uh, making this space available at $15 a square foot, and that's about what the average is in the city of Fort Wayne. Um, I don't know that that's going to be sustainable because anybody that's taken any kind of basic economics knows that if you increase the supply in order to have the same number of things go through, you're going to have to reduce the price. So um, it's very likely that they're not going to get the rents that are going to be required to repay the debt that they're going to have to take on to make this project work just from the pure economics of you're massively increasing supply. And up until a couple years ago, just in downtown Fort Wayne, the absorption rate of commercial real estate was negative. I mean, we just went positive in commercial real estate absorption rates in the last few years. So to add this additional supply is going to be very difficult to absorb. Additional concerns are going to be the access. I mean, so this, this property is surrounded by a railroad that Norfolk Southern owns. And, and to be able to work with the railroad, to be able to allow them to have widening of train trestles or bridges, or this is going to be very difficult to do. It's going to take a long time to get that accomplished and will be a very... Um, it's going, to, it's going to be a throttle on the project because you're not going to be able to get traffic down there. You're going to, the, the, the only approach that there is right now is down Broadway. Okay, here's the train trestle. As you can see, it's pretty narrow. And if you had a couple thousand tenants and people coming in and out of there, you're going to have a hard time getting the traffic in and out of this position. Uh, this is just south of downtown. Um, we're, we are facing south, so downtown is behind us. And it would be a very difficult spot to, uh, to get the necessary traffic to the facility from here. And they're talking about taking the uh, I&M um, utilities easement path to have an additional roadway to get there from Jefferson um, before you get to the West Central if you're coming from the West. Uh, that's going to be a lot of investment. So we, we had talked earlier about you know, why I believe that that 65 million number is actually a low estimate of what the final ask to the city is going to be because this breaks down into uh, 20 million dollars of legacy, uh, 40 million of CIB, and 5 million of county grants. These will likely be in the form of loans. Additionally, though, they're asking they're, in their spreadsheets and what they're thinking, they're going to need another $10 million of TIF streetscape 
grants. Another $15 million of additional road work and construction. So we're looking at closer to $90 million for the uh, local contribution. And this is just for phase one. So we, we had earlier talked about it's going to be $100 million for the total for phase one and two. Most likely, we're going to be at over, over $90 million just for phase one. So, and that's if this thing gets done. So um, those are my concerns with the General Electric, Electric Works uh, project. Um, I keep saying General Electric. The, the General Electric no longer owns the property. The property is owned um, by a partnership, LLC, that was created by the developer to be the sole owner of this thing. That is your special purpose vehicle. All right. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. You can send me an email at, um, I believe it's friendsofjasonarp at gmail.com. You can put something in the comments here. And uh, if you like these videos, you want to get more information on this, you can uh, see these in your email box, click subscribe and uh, please share with your friends. Thank you.